Well rehearsed. <laughs> I do apologise for the parking. Sir Nicholas Bacon and his trustees are entertaining their tenant farm and, and the, you know, the great and the good and all the rest of it. And of course they've taken up all our car parking space, haven't they? Uh, however, the, the, there are some compensations for tonight because we've got Kevin coming to talk about um, the making of the guidebook. But he's also going to extend the talk as well. Um, uh, so we're in for a, a real good evening. And um, no more ado, Kevin. <laughs> All right, really good evening. You're in for a real good evening. Oh, echoes in a strange way. Uh, right, I've uh, been at the pool. I'll have to get used to that. Uh, good evening. Uh, some faces I recognise, many others I don't. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you all for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, Kevin Booth, Senior Curator of Collections for English Heritage. Um, senior, cura senior Curator uh, means, uh, well, collect Senior Curator for the North of England, which for us means uh, basically Lincolnshire and Nottinghamshire, up to Berwick and across to Cumbria and back down through Lancashire. So um, Gainsborough is one of 46 sites where we have um, where we have collections of historic interiors on display um, in, the, in that patch. Um, we look after around a third of a million artifacts from the English Heritage properties on that patch. So um, it's quite a quite an effort. Uh, I think that may be the earliest guide to uh, Games of the World Hall. I've not found one earlier. There's various sort of archaeological society reports and things, but I think that's... Uh, do we know what year? It's not got a year on the back, Paul. Any ideas? No. Probably 16th In the 50s, I would have thought. Yeah. Okay. Right. Let's get the hang of this. On the left is uh, Hickman Becky Bacon. And in 1924, he writes to the secretary of the Office of Works, uh, and he asks them, or he says, I'm the owner of an old Tudor manor house standing upon two acres of ground near the centre of the town of Gainsborough, and I am anxious to ascertain whether it could be taken over by the Office of Works. So this is 1924. He, he suggests that this might be done under the terms of the Age of Monuments Act of 1913, with a view of this being adequately preserved at the public expense. <laughs> he goes to London, there's a couple of meetings, the Office of Works called Piers, so Charles Piers, the Chief Inspector, comes up and, and has a look at the building, and they politely decline. <laughs> now, as, you know, oof, boom. Um, as you obviously are aware, Sir Edmund then places the hall into the care, effectively, of the Friends Group in 1949, it comes into the care of the state in 1970, and 96 years after Hickman Beckett makes his first appeal, English Heritage, who are effectively the successor of the Office of Works, um, become the managers, the operators of that old hall. Um, that transfer from Lincoln County Council, who had been running it since in the late 70s, um, something like, um, came, back, came back fairly rapidly. Uh, there were moves made just before the pandemic, and then, of course, the pandemic hit. Um, and um, as, as that, during that sort of main pandemic part of time, Lincoln confirmed that they wanted to terminate the lease, and a date of November 2020 was set. And we all flew into a sort of mild panic <laughs> at, the, uh, at the prospect of it. Um, I have to say, the initial response was that we might have to mothball. Um, the pandemic being as it was, we simply had no idea what the finances would look like out at the end of it. We had no idea what staff we would have. Uh, and we had no idea whether, in a time of COVID, we could carry out a major conservation or representation project. But 
With some credit to my figures and betters, and I don't always give them credit, they bit the bullet and they said, no, we will reopen in July of 2021. Okay, just hoping that's working for you. Um, we managed it. You can judge how well or not. Um, but 20 months on, from hands over, we are at last delighted to publish the new guidebook, which I believe will arrive in stone. <laughs> arrive in stocks at the Old Hall on Thursday and hopefully will there be for you to go and peruse and choose to purchase. My editor, the editor of the Gambit series, says this has been a monster. Um, <laughs> but it's one I think, well, I'm very proud to have been involved with and, and, and been asked to produce. Now, tonight is not uh, an account of how English Heritage put their stamp on that Old Hall nor is it a regurgitation of a history of the old hall, which you probably have already heard many, many times. Um, I will introduce the new guide, and I've sacked some dreadful sort of purveyor of... Uh, here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, I will introduce that, the way we've structured the content, the kind of format it has. But I wanted also to give some sense of how, in this relatively short time, we've come to a point where we felt confident enough in our knowledge about that building to actually write a document like this. I'll look at where we were perhaps in November 2020, uh, something of what the consensus history of this of that building, this building, I feel we should be in there, um, of that building is, or was, we'll look at how we sort of built our own surety on our own sort of narrative of the place, um, a mix of analysing the existing documents that are out there, um, of where possible going back to primary sources, and where possible commissioning new and targeted research. Um, as part of this, I thought I'd just take, later in the talk, I'll just take one element of the building and try and sort of read its history through the kind of insights that we gained over the last 20 months, and that, that element will be the southeast apartments, um, uh, the three-story section at the end of the, of the East Range. But really, in some ways, I've probably already missed lots of slides. Well, there we go, that was one slide I missed, but you probably know what that is. Um, yeah, I like that one. Um, because, in a way, this presentation is a sort of personal account. Uh, it's a reflection on... Uh, <laughs> the Old Hall is a building that I confess I knew precious little about in November 2020. I had visited, but I hadn't researched, I hadn't really got the sense of what that building was, and this is sort of an account of how I've progressed with that building and how I feel that, what does it mean to me? Well, it's part of me now, absolutely part of me. Uh, it's probably given me, that project, the most sort of exhilarating experience of my career, I will admit. Um, I was not entirely green at handover. There'd been six months of preparation um, after Lincoln committed on their plan to, to leave. That coincided obviously with a period of furlough for most of my team and, and it seems like something of a blur. But the priority in those six months before Lincoln handed over was to work through the collections and the, and the props that were on site and try as best as we could. This is a view from I think the, the middle to late 1950s of one of the arrangements that the Friends had put in place. I hope that wasn't me, sorry. <laughs> Don't worry, it doesn't matter. Um, to try and understand the, the provenance and the significance of everything that was in that building uh, and decide what Lincoln would take with them and what we would seek to retain. And in the end, I confess that it was largely items of the, uh, the Friends collection which left the building, or booze if you wish. Um, there was sort of the residual selection of ornament and ceramics that were in the display cases um, and some of the furniture that was up, up in the top there as well were friends collection um, and I, I did decide that they, they didn't fit the stories that I felt I was wanting to tell um, at the old hall. Um, that collection, the friends collection, I think it's over 10,000 items in it, um, collected by Ellen Grace and others in the 1950s and 60s. That's a whole other topic, 
but if you won that, it would be fantastic to explore the defence field. Um, it's in Lincoln. I mean, it's been looked after exceedingly well in, in, in the Lincoln Museum collections. No, no, it's all beautifully catalogued and beautifully uh, packed away and stored in the right conditions and, and all that. But it is obviously relatively inaccessible, and it would be great to talk through in the future how to sort of renew interest in that in that collection because there's some brilliant stuff in it. Um, we retained much of what was what we call the vacant loan, so portraits and the furniture that's in the building. We also, of course, retained the bed. I felt I'd be shot if I let the bed go. Um, and we kept those props that Lincoln were willing to offer up. Um, I'm afraid the stuff swan uh, they wanted to take with them. So don't blame me for the loss of the stuff swan. Um, even uh, Sir Nicholas Bacon's material uh, was thinned, we selected out. There were 26 portraits in there when I came to the building, there's now only 13. Um, the reasons for that, the portraits were in a shocking condition. They weren't happy in that environment and I, I basically sent back all those that did not relate immediately to the building. Members of the Bacon family several times we moved who never had anything to do with the hall, and I retained the 13 portraits of the people who'd ever ownership and active interest in, in the building. Um, that six months leading up to handover, it felt like quite a sort of intuitive session. I didn't feel like I really could bottom anything out. I just had to make these, these judgments, and time will tell whether I've been correct with all of those. But it's also a good word for that research period after we took the old hall on. Because, I mean, there was a lot being written about the old hall from Stark and Miller through uh, numerous Country Life articles, through the guidebooks, through the accounts of learned societies who've been there, uh, through the papers published by the Friends Group, through the wonderful notes and correspondence that the previous curator, Jenny Vernon, had left in filing cabinets up there. Thank goodness for those. Uh, and the, the, what's called the Lindley volume, so the 1991 uh, summary volume of new research on the building. All of those were integral to my getting to know the place, but I found that a lot had been written and a fair amount of investigation had been undertaken, but I wasn't sure yet how much was really understood about the building. Um, and I also found that in the sort of retelling of the narrative of the whole, it has sort of developed its own certainties and its own truths. Um, things were stated, they were adapted, they were adopted, and then, then themselves became fact, if you like. Um, which is not meant as a sort of criticism of previous work, because if I go to any of my sites, we have the same pattern, where things you know, over 20 or 30 years become robust. Um, I fully expect in five to 10 years, people will look at some of the content in here and wonder how I came to that conclusion. Um, it's also true that um, sites like this, where the community is so actively involved, um, the sort of narrative of the site can sometimes narrow down to quite a narrow, um, set of, of storylines. They seem to be the stories that the communities help shape and the ones that have meaning to them. So there was a sense of trying to break out of that and question a lot of those narratives and a lot of that perceived history. I like to tell myself that I was coming to the building you know, as, uh, as fresh and standing aloof and being objective. I don't know that, that is, that's quite true and certainly when Catherine came to edit my text for the guidebook, she found lots of things to pick up and question that perhaps I hadn't adequately uh, taken on board. But perhaps the, the biggest thing that shaped that early research was COVID and the fact that archives were shut and I couldn't get access to a lot of the primary information. Um, I'm an archaeologist by by you know, some long distant past. So there was an amount we could do to try and unpick the structure of the building just by 
good archaeological study and revisiting the excavation archives that we have. Um, we were able, and I'll demonstrate this with some paint analysis that we conducted, we were able to conduct a, a small amount of new research into the building. Um, but really I was sort of left with the material that was immediately available or I could find online, which led me down the wonderful rabbit hole of online newspaper accounts. <laughs> Don't ever sign in to British newspapers online because all your evenings disappear until very late at night. It's obsessive, you can't stop looking for the next little article about what Miss Pye the librarian was said about such and such in the Literary Institute at Gainsborough. Um, so the accounts of the Literature Chronicle, the Stanford Mercury, Mercury, the Hull Advertiser, I think it was, and the Leeds something or other, it all took me into the world of Gainsborough and the old hall in its later period, which is just this sort of riot of different uses and different people and their stories and of politics and performances and civic pride and business going on in commerce and, and learning and entertainment. And it, the, that sort of 19th century hall just suddenly came alive for me, which was fortunate because as a confession, I, I was struggling with the life and times of Thomas Burr. Okay, I shouldn't say this is probably a heresy in this. this Borough. Borough. <laughs> I stand. You corrected me about four times on that. The life and times of Thomas Borough. First law, not Thomas Borough too. Okay. <laughs> um, I couldn't. I just. I don't know. I couldn't find him in the building somehow. I couldn't, I couldn't relate to him, stuff or swan or no stuff swan, in the building. And it, and it was sort of through these newspaper articles and finding this later vibrant history that I, I in some way, I tracked back. Because um, those news, newspaper accounts and the accounts of Stark and Miller, um, they, they populated the building with this sort of cast of characters. Um, and I sort of, well, I like to think that that, that Oh dear. I always start off on this one and it sounds pathetic somehow. Or slightly sort of far too arty. Um, the building for me became this sort of uh, stage, if you like, and I just felt that it broke down into little acts and you could find these characters in the building and you could almost start to write their lines. And that was my way in to, to understanding that structure, because there were the, the kind of anecdotes of actual events that had gone and real lives that were lived, um, and there was where you start seeing the pull and the push of influences and necessity that had shaped that building from the early 19th century through to the to the late 20th. A couple of examples of the kind of things that you know, pop out. Thomas Miller, like writes that fantastic line about you know grand or whatever it is of the feudal age. But he, he also writes this gorgeous um, line about Lady Frances Hickman, the last of the Hickman line, who dies in 1826. And he says, he says, were it not robbing heaven, robbing heaven of its highest angels, one would have wished that such a woman might never die, nor even grow older. Um, a newspaper article about Mr. Sankey, who was manager of the theatre in the 1840s. Mr. Sankey dressed as a clown would make a trip, or it was, it was said, that Mr. Sankey, dressed as a clown, would be making a trip down the river in a tub drawn by four geese. Um, a small crowd gathered to witness the spectacle, only to return disappointed. Mr. Mr. Sankey, it seemed, had retired for the evening. Um, uh, Paul is familiar with this one. On Henry Slight, the young boy who dies aged five in 1881, in the West Wing, uh, a scholar he counted the peals of the parish church as they chimed five o'clock. Um, and then one I found in one of the Office of Works, what we call registry files, our sort of archive of documents. A letter written by Ellen Brace, not long after her husband had died, uh, where she writes to uh, Roy Gilead Beer, the then inspector, and towards the end of it, he, she sort of pleads, she says, enthusiasm and energy are growing less. I feel I cannot go on much longer. The whole situation is getting desperate. It's things like that, really, that 
help me find a way in to the building. And we started to think about the whole, not through its sort of chronological account or its account of lords and kings and important men particularly, or divided up into family lineages or divided up by different blocks of ownership over the time. Instead we found that there were themes that seemed to cut across the whole history and which sort of tied the history together. Themes around status, whether you were rich or poor, whether you had power or whether you were in service. Um, themes around the relationship between the building and its community and the town, around the role of faith uh, and other superstitions that you find within that building. Um, ideas around business and pleasure, around what's private and what's public, and around performance. I go back to this idea of the stage set. Um, and that, I probably missed loads of slides, but let's not worry. They're not massively tied. That's a nice one. 1835, I think it is. I'll stick on that. Perhaps that's somewhere I'm going to think. Yes, it is where I'm going to think. Those sort of cross cutting themes seem to suit the building as well, because the building, that dear old vestige of the feudal age, is. is both a wonderful survival, but it's also an infuriating hodgepodge. Um, there are a few rooms in that building which have not been tampered with. There's very little, very few spaces in the building which read as a period space. The kitchen is probably one of the few, if not the only real space that reads as its late 15th century uh, coherent self. Everything else has been sort of pulled apart slightly and put back together, and I'm not quite sure who's put what back together and exactly why, and whether it matches the original evidence or whether it was an imagination. And the Friends group, I have to say, along with the Officer, Officer Works, were guilty of a fair amount of that in the 1950s. Mm, there. Um, <laughs> like, like we haven't been since. But, um, so it sort of enhanced in my mind this idea of skeletal stage sets where some had a little bit of scenery hung on them, some of them were almost fully prepared as a stage and others were just left empty waiting waiting for a performance to start. And that, that way of thinking allowed us allowed me back into the early history of the building and to start thinking about the Hickmans and thinking about the birds and how they resided and what they contributed to that building. Uh, and what's all that saying? Um, it's saying that I don't sort of read that building as a, as a story of Lord this or King that, or as a structure of a late medieval household that happens to have been tampered with. I kind of read it as this 500 year continuum, and that the people in it are all as interesting as each other, going right up to today, today basically. Everything has contributed in some way to that structure. And once you get the hang of all of those, the whole thing just becomes um, and a colleague summarised it, he said, he said that we were seeking the hum of humanity. Um, okay, that was, that was good, that was, that was, that was the idea. Um, now, how am I doing? Oh, goodness. Um, the East Range, so I thought I'd pick out the East Range, Pointer, um, and the, the apartment. So it's just this end, the, the sort of bottom two bays of, of the East Range. Um, so how we sort of looked at the existing narrative and questioned it and perhaps changed it in places, but always I hope adding and sort of enriching and layering what we can understand about just that one small area of the building. The conventional history as we know it was that the East Range is constructed uh, circa 1465 to 70, uh, this East Range is almost certainly contemporary with the, the Central Range here, with the Great Hall at its core. Um, that in uh, around 1600, William Hickman converts what had been a two-floor apartment into a three-story residence and clads uh, the whole of it down this side and here in brick, uh, adding new windows, fireplaces, chimneys, um, and that the, the, the wall painting within the now shop area and the panelling within the 
small dining parlor, dining parlor is part of Higgins' work. Um, Stark then tells us that from, 18, from around 1730 for 20 years, Lord Abingdon, or Willoughby Bertie, the future third Lord Abingdon, uh, leases the East Range. Um, and that then in uh, around 1890, it was understood that Frederick Baines and his wife Anne had taken the lease on the old hall and ad adopted this as their as their residence, which Mr. Edmund Dorman then took on until he died in June of 1961, the last resident of the old hall. Um, so uh, I, I'm a I'm a structural archaeologist by sort of trade by profession. So I look at buildings and I try and unpick the different phases. I am not a timber frame expert at all, so this building is something of a challenge. But to, to go back to, um, to go back to uh, Thomas Burrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's actually a case to be made to say that Thomas only builds these range to here. And that this Southern, these southern two bays are in addition. Um, you can't really see it here, but at the point where the narrow doorway into the stairwell is, there's a straight joint where the great chamber ends with its own independent structural frame and where these are added onto it, they're pinned onto it. And I wonder, actually, whether that is represented in the, the slumping that has happened in those two bays. But that it's, it's doing that on the joint, and the foundations are different, and the timbers are different. There's just a little bit of possible corroborating evidence in that in Thomas Burr's, Burr's <laughs> probate will of 1496, or probate inventory, which is a, a fragmentary document. But what we survive is a kind of room by room progression of what is in each room. And if you follow the progression and you try and allot the room names to the existing chambers, you find these are missing. They're not in the inventory. It goes from the next chamber to the best chamber, and then it goes uh, to the great chamber, and then it goes downstairs to the great parlour and progresses off that direction. These appear to be missing, and I just wonder in 1496 whether they'll even exist. Um, regardless, a two-storey extension had been built, definitely, before someone makes that adaptation to a three-storey um, apartment. I hope you're vaguely following all of this, I'm not sure I'm following it myself. Um, the date of... Oh, we're on, the, we're on that side. We're on that side? I think we'll stick with that. The date, then, of the conversion to three storeys. It's absolutely, it's, it's always said to be hidden. It's dated as around 1600, and it seems to be dated there because uh, Stark tells us that there is a plaque um, with William Hickman's initials on, a sundial, and a date, 1600. Um, and then, the, now, does anyone know anything of Gainsburgiensis? That's disappointing. There's a wonderful scrapbook that I inherited as part of the archive over there, and it's, it's, an, it's obviously a newspaper serialisation of the history of Gainsborough, and I think it's written in about 1879, something like that. And someone's cut them all out and pasted them into this scrapbook, and it's, it's byline, Gains, Gainsborough Gainsis, and it's the most fantastic contemporary account of that building. And he says, the eastern gable shows evidence of having been pierced with several large windows now closed, and in the gable is a stone panel, so he says he's seen it. Um, upon which are the initials William Hickman and the legend, I'm not going to say the Latin, but I'll make a fool of myself, even more than Burra. Um, and it's dated 1600. But he also tells us that the western gable has a stone, on which has been, uh, there is a coat of arms, and here it is, and there it is in this shot from the early 20th century, or mid 20th century. Um, and the coat of arms is known to be of the boroughs. So we have an account of changes in the building which both says William Hickman dates it as 1600, but also apparently 
the boroughs have to be involved with it. Now, the West Gable and the East Gable, if you look at them both, they're pretty much identical. They're, they're contemporary bills. So we, I don't know whether they're contemporary bill in the late borough period or contemporary bill in Hickman's period. So there's a sort of little questioning to be left there as to whether it was a real Hickman who constructs the um, uh, who constructs the three-story apartments. Um, Hickman's own programme inventory gives us as well a rundown of the rooms and from which you can deduce that the, the, the small, the panel room as we call it, is the small dining parlour in Hickman's time. Um, that's interesting because we carried out some paint analysis, paint scrapes of different places within that room and if you section the paint scrapes you can start to see all the layers of paint that have been applied over, in this case, uh, 400 years. Um, and at the, at the beginning here, the earliest coat of paint directly onto the bare oak panelling is a pale stone colour lead paint. And if we trace through the different paints that have been applied, virtually all of them are pale stone colours. It's only, it seems, in the last coloured paint that was applied, sometime in the 1870s or 80s, I think, that we get that brown, darkened, Victorian concept of what a room like that. So you have to reread William Hickman's small dining parlour as actually quite a light space with a great roaring fire in it. Um, and it, it sort of gives it a different character, I think. Um, Above that, we can be fairly certain, is William Hickman's bedchamber. Um, lit by three large windows, heated by a new stone fireplace, hung with textiles and containing his curtained four-poster bed, says the inventory. Um, that inventory lists over 100 possessions in the one room. Um, and it's a friend's document that first transcribes that inventory. Um, and is published in one of your lovely little pamphlets from the late 1950s. Um, uh, possessions including a jewellery cabinet with pearls, diamonds and rubies, fine linen, and a little casket with bizarre stone and unicorn's horn. Excellent. Um, a bizarre, a bizarre stone was apparently a rare oriental stone which actually comes from an animal intestine. Um, uh, a prize, apparently, as a talisman and an antidote. An antidote to what? I don't know. Um, uh, the stove was set within a horned vessel, uh, which we might presume was perhaps rhino rather than unicorn, but unicorn would be a turn up. Um, <laughs> above that space, uh, the Hickman inventory seems to say a um, nursery. We then move on to uh, Willoughby, Hickman, uh, Willoughby Bertie, the third lord of Abingdon for whom we only have this one reference in stock. As far as I'm aware, there is no other documentary source that says Willoughby Bertie had anything to do with this building. It's just one of those starkisms, and we trust it if we like. But, interestingly, the paint analysis, I can't remember which scheme it is on this one, is about here. There are adaptations made to the fireplace with sort of little um, pilasters added um, absolutely meeting a kind of Palladian style of the early 18th century. And there's paint schemes on here, um, a particular type of paint that you would not see pre about 1730. So it's just possible we are seeing Willoughby Bertie occupying this building because we actually have the physical evidence of changes being made by someone in residence at that time. Um, we then have a whole series of other paint schemes going through the late 18th and through the 19th century, of which, at the moment, I cannot attach to known occupants, known activity. I just know that activity is continuing within that space, probably continuously, uh, through the whole period. Um, which takes us through to uh, around 1850, when the uh, literary, now get it the right way around, Literary Scientific and Mechanics Institute of Gainsborough takes up residence on the ground floor of the uh, East Hall. Um, 
They have, uh, they're listed as having a reading room, uh, a newsroom, and a library. Uh, and newspaper accounts are fantastic for a literary institute. They bring all sorts of characters to life, including one of my favourites, Mr. Gamble. If anyone knows anything of Mr. Gamble, I'm happy to hear. Um, it appears regularly in newspaper uh, columns um, as a sort of, uh, he's a sort of administrative person. He gives, often gives the welcome to um, um, so, uh, Henry Bacon Hickman, or Hickman Bacon, depending on which one is there at the time. And uh, is it and um, Anderson, another of the big sort of landowners from the, towards the south of the... So Charles Anderson. Charles Anderson. Yeah. So, um, so Mr. Gamble gives the sort of uh, welcome and, and, and the glowing, glowing uh, flattery to them at each meeting. Um, but he's also a dramatist and he's a musician and um, I think he's possibly also the Mr. Gamble who was captain of the Lincolnshire Rifles in 1872. Uh, and the Lincolnshire Rifles also come to the Old Hall in the East Range and give regular performances of uh, a musical troupe. So he's quite a chap, is, is Gamble. And he introduces, um, slight diversion here, he introduces the Penny Readings to the Old Hall in 1864. There'd be much chatter in the committee meetings of the Literary Institute that um, they weren't attracting enough of the working classes. So they established penny readings, um, which was kind of this you know, doggerel poetry and clippets of Shakespeare and little bits of popular music. Um, and they proved a great success. They regularly attracted over 300 people into the Great Hall. Um, but a couple of newspaper articles report that um, behavior was at times unruly. <laughs> Um, which, whether that's what the Reverend such and such at the Literary Institute wanted, I don't know. Um, anyway, the readings were discontinued just before 1870, as far as I can tell. Um, they themselves have brought a revenue to the Institute of around £12 a year. And in 1870, once they'd stopped, the Institute was £12 in deficit. Uh, it closed in 1872, perhaps not surprisingly. Um, this was nice. This is a plan found in one of these Office of Works registry files. And it's a plan that Hickman Beckham, but Beckett Bacon had sent to Sir Charles Piers uh, to entice him into the building. But it's a plan that he says himself in a letter was drawn up, I think, by George Summers Clark, who does a lot of Beckett Bacon's restoration in 1878. So I think it's a plan drawn up in 1878 by Clark at which he lists, going back to these apartments, and why I've made a slight diversion into the Institute, he lists here um, that it was formerly, the, well, it says stock library, and then someone's written in formerly the stock library of the Institute. And I think, perhaps, that the ground floor room, the panel room was the library, and the room above, the bedchamber, was the stock room for it. Ah, now, keeping up, Good. Um, where are we now? Okay, so the Literary Institute closes in 1872. The next jump has always been to the Masons who take over the East Range in 1896. The Yarborough Lodge uh, adopts those rooms as its Masonic temple. Um, but there was something that didn't quite add up because here this is a fragment of um, anaglyph to wallpaper. Two layers, one down here, just see the traces, and one above. Which, if you look in the cafe around the fireplace, you'll still, still see on the wall. And that wallpaper doesn't predate 1870s. In fact, it probably is 1870s in date. So, and if you look at the wallpaper, and you look at the, the data rail and the picture rail, and the sort of the, in the ceiling, it's, uh, it's a little bordered ceiling on it. All of that seems to date to just after the Literary Institute give the property up. So something's going on, and it turns out that another Masonic Lodge, the uh, John O'Gord Lodge, actually were consecrated in the building in 1874. So we've got another Mason taking on, and I think this whole decorative scheme has been put in by the John O'Gold Lodge, Lodge into what is now the cafe space. Um, why that's interesting to the East Departments, or South East Departments, is that prior to this scheme going in 1874, there was a doorway through, from the cafe, 
can see it in the wall, in, blocked up in the wall, with a doorway leading through into this little side part. And there wasn't a doorway here. If you can picture that little dining room, you go through another doorway into that side pallet pile where the, the turret graffiti is. That doorway didn't exist pre-1870s. Um, and we know it didn't exist because, again, of paint analysis. And when you look at the scrape from the door and the frame around it, it only has one layer of paint, and that is the dark layer. So it has no history pre whenever those spaces were converted. And I think those spaces must be converted back into a residence at the same time they close this door, because otherwise you wouldn't have any access into that room. And that door is closed at the same time they put this wallpaper up. So it's tying it together to say sometime in the mid-1870s, we have the masons coming in, and we have this being converted back into a residence. And we can be fairly certain it's converted back into a residence for Mr. and Mrs. Frederick and Anne Baines. Um, who are registered as resident there in 1881 in the census. So, on to, on to the Baines. Uh, he's an interesting chap, Frederick Baines. Um, he had an association with the building previously. Oh, hello. Oh, there he is. He had an association previously because he was secretary and then librarian to the institute. But he takes a lease on the building. Now, I think he must take a lease on the whole building. I don't... <coughs> I can't quite read it, but I think he takes a lease on the whole building that sets up residence, him and Anne, in that three-storey accommodation. And he's an auctioneer, and we know that he uses spaces in the building for his auction, auctions and his, and his stock room. Um, they take the ground floor room, the panelled room, as their dining room. The little side chamber, there's a lovely photograph of their sort of, it looks like a breakfast room, perhaps, and there's a lovely picture of Baines himself in his Masonic regalia, because he's the caretaker of the Masons as well, hung on the wall. Um, and then in the room above, William Hickman's bedchamber now becomes uh, Frederick and Anne's sitting room. You, you, I'm sure most of you are familiar with these photographs, they're in the Lincoln archives, and it's a wonderful sequence. Most of them, I think, are sort of 1919, 1920-ish, but we now think the series that document the room, we've got four angles of this one room, are probably rather like Thomas Burroughs' probate inventory and William's probate. I think they're actually photographs taken after Frederick's death to record what's in the room in 1934. Um, they set about uh, decorating and filling it with possessions, uh, which kind of reveal a, a sort of slightly conservative taste mostly, but then uh, some, some some nods to modern fashion. And one of those nods is the wallpaper, which you can see the traces of in this photograph. Um, so we went hunting the wallpaper um, in all the archives, the wallpaper archives. I got someone to go looking for it, and we couldn't find the exact match anywhere. So we went to Sanderson Design, who are the kind of globe, world famous wallpaper people, and they commissioned this. So this is a recreation, as best as we know it, of Frederick and Anne's wallpaper. So you can now imagine William Hickman's bedchamber, stark as it is, stripped back to the brickwork, actually painted in this Art Nouveau wallpaper, uh, which we hope to reintroduce to the chimney breast later this, this year. So we're going to get it actually printed on historic paper and, and try and re, re, remount it. Um, as an aside, in the Friends archive, there's also this very, very faded fragment of Art Nouveau wallpaper, and I just wonder whether that was from their bedroom above, because it's the Friends in 1970, 1971, who strip all this out, uh, and presumably clear the upstairs room as well, so it's possible that this is a second, second pattern that we have surviving. Um, oh. We can look at their possessions as well. Um, hello, sorry. Um, I got someone to look at all these photographs, and he's managed to produce an inventory, just like the Hickman inventory, of over 130 pieces of uh, ornament, soft furnishings, furniture, paintings, etchings that we can see 
in that room, which gives us this insight into the Baines and their character and what their tastes were. At least we thought it gave us an insight into that, and I'll come back to that in a second. Because not all is quite as it seems with Mr. and Mrs. Baines. Um, if we look at the censuses, and we can read what we will into this, um, Anne is present in 1881. She's not resident in 1891, or 1901, or 1911. She lives with her sister in Cleethorpes. Um, she's back in 1921, um, and presumably that's not far from that date, that photograph taken. So I don't know whether she happens to be on holiday over there every time the census comes up. Um, but Mr. Baines and possibly Anne have a series of housekeepers. In 1901, it's Harriet Heaton. 1911, it's Hannah Powell. 1921, it's Elsie Annie. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, a colleague of mine was reading an account of um, James Lees Milne, uh, who I think was a National Trust sort of surveyor going around after the war, during the war, to see what properties could be taken in. Uh, and he, he only writes two lines about Gainsborough. I'll give you the second one in a minute. He says, there's a device in one bedroom a hammer attached to the wall under the ceiling over the bed, which when pulled, knocks loudly against the beam under the floor above of the housemaid's room in order to wake her up. I don't know, is that Frederick Baines? I don't know, comments. Um, so the second surprise about the Baines and their furniture is that I don't think it's their furniture. It seems that they rent, lease the property furnished from Hickman, Becky, Burke, Bacon. Because when we've looked at their furniture, or the furniture in, it's a really odd hodgepodge for a start. It's not the sort of material we'd expect an auctioneer of the late 19th century to be interested in. And there are at least two, possibly three pieces that we can see in those rooms, which are still on display in that building, and are the property of Sir Nicholas Bacon. And this is a shot from the earlier 20th century in the assembly room, and you can see lots of furniture stockpiled. Um, our friend uh, Lees Milne says, um, the house is stacked, literally stacked, on top of the other with treasures belonging to Hickman Bacon. They're not even covered with dust sheets. They're gathering dust and filth from the pigeons which scramble through the roof and roost in the great hall. So we've got a sense, actually, that for quite some period from the 19th century, the Bacons are storing quite a lot of their furniture, some of which happens to get used by Frederick and Anne in their accommodation, which is really exciting, because then you start to think, okay, how much of this furniture which you see here has actually been there an awful lot longer? And this furniture which has a, you know, a legacy in perhaps even the Hickman residence. Well, Peter Breers blew that one out of the water. Um, the Furniture History Regional Furniture Society visited last year and Peter made another visit. And he looked at all that furniture that's on loan from St. Nicholas and said, it's all a fake. It's a mid-19th century concoction. It's not a historic assemblage at all. Most of it is either newly made to look old, with old bits clagged on, or it is old, but it's been adapted and a bit of heraldry added and a few of the right motifs added to it to create a 19th century uh, heritage, effectively, to give Sir Henry, get it right way around, Bacon, Hickman, um, a kind of lineage through his furniture. Now, whether that was short lived and they ended up just storing it in the hall because actually they realised that it didn't really say a great deal about them or whether they were just overflowing in Bonacol. Bonacol Thonic. Okay, I'm right on that one then. Um, so that, was, that, that again was really interesting. So Frederick and Anne are basically leasing, um, leasing rooms filled with 19th century um, fakes that Hayden um, Beck and Bacon doesn't want in his own house. Um, Frederick dies in 1931. Anne dies in Parnell Street in 1937. Uh, the apartment lease, oh sorry, I'm going on, um, is taken by Mr. Edmund Dorber and his wife Emily, probably, I think, in 1933. Mr. Dorber again is caretaker to the Masons. Um, he lives the rest of his life there, passing away on 
June the 10th, 1861, aged 86, the last resident of the hall. And um, there's in the Friends newspaper scrapbook, there's a fantastic article, obituary to Edmund Dorber, um, where one of his friends says of him, he says, it is his old world courtesy, his courtliness in deportment and in speech that many will remember above all else. He was no less courteous to the Coleman, do come in and have a sherry, than to seeing the scene of Duchess. It was the outward expression of the grace of God that was in him. Gainsborough has lost a treasured link with the rest of the past. Virtue has gone out of the town. <laughs> we who were lucky enough to be his friends are impoverished by his going. I mean, that's a great, you'd be happy, wouldn't you, if someone wrote that about you? Um, we were also contacted by a chap called Dean Graham, who'd been, um, he said when he was about eight, um, his mum in Parnell Street made and plated up dinners for Mr. Dorman. And young Dean would go over and he'd knock on the door in the courtyard side of these apartments, and he'd go in, and Mr. Dorman would always be sat at the table in his waistcoat and tie and jacket suit. And uh, he says, he said he was always polite and always friendly, even to this young lad who delivered his meal. He then, Mr. Dorman then washed up and left the plates um, just outside on the threshold to be collected. I like Mr. Dorber a lot. Um, is it so? Yeah, I'll come on to it. Anyway, that was a very prolonged diversion about the East Range, but it kind of says something about what for all of those spaces was beginning to start to do, to unpick them in, and layer them and layer them and layer them and find the voices that sit within each of those spaces, uh, which to me just seemed to animate the building so much more than a stuffed swan, but that's, you know, that's my opinion. So anyway, look, it's one of those, he touts it again. Um, we've been producing what we call our red guides, as the clue is, yeah, um, since 2005. I think this may be the 93rd uh, in the series. We've got 120 sites where we effectively have shots, so we've got a few to go yet, but Gainsborough is, is our 93rd. Uh, and they are our best-selling item, I'm told, in our gift shops. Excellent. Um, we use them as really sort of important repositories of the kind of information that I've scrolled through this evening. There's way more detail than what I've said than it should be in here. Sometimes they're the only sort of single print account of one of our sites. Um, they are for other means of documenting the English Heritage Portfolio, and through them, if you read several of them, you start to see the links between the different sites and why our portfolio has a sort of cohesion to it. They absolutely should communicate the latest research that's available, um, and they should be, I hope, visually appealing to a much wider audience. Um, they do act as an important visitor's guide. People do buy them, and they do take the sort of tour but they're also meant to be something you take home, it's background, it's follow-up and context. They're meant to be a sort of memory uh, of the visit. Um, so they meet the needs of visitor information, they're a memory of the site, but they also meet our needs, the organization's need to document the research that it's carrying out and document it in, the, in you know, more than just fairly dry academic papers delivered in obscure societies, of which this is not one. <laughs> I realize I'm needed. Um, each guidebook, um, well, I was told when I was writing it, has the objective of being lively, authoritative, and attractive. Yikes. Um, the style is aimed at both accessible, assuming, uh, a style aimed at is both accessible, assuming no knowledge, uh, previous knowledge of the site, and authoritative, incorporating the most recent research. Um, so we see that it sort of splits into two sections of our guidebooks. There's a tour of the hall and you go from space to space and it's not just a dry description but hopefully some of the little anecdotes and the stories and the, and the oddities to point out are brought into that text. And then there's a, a what is more of a sort of chronological narrative history but it's broken up by a series of um, uh, sort of little boxes, um, you know, where we break out into little themes and discuss little elements of, and uh, you'll find one about the Friends group.
towards the back of the group, uh, towards the back of the book. Here we go. Um, I have to say, it was a normally there'd be reconstruction drawings as well, but we just haven't had the resource or the time for this particular edition to do those kind of cutaway reconstruction drawings that show you the, the development of the building. Um, when Catherine Davy first came up in January of 2021 and commissioned the guidebook, she, she said 16 pages, uh, or she said this on the train before she came up, 16 pages, let's just get it done. Um, she went away, came back, said 48 pages would do. So, yeah. Um, and so for all the reasons I've sort of tried to say today, it, it, I found it actually a really challenging, really challenging text to write because I, I felt in November 2020, for the next six or seven months, I felt that this wasn't even my building to write about. That I was so new to it, that, that there was so much that I felt I just did not understand about it. Um, so I'm glad that there's been a, a longer period to produce this document and hopefully with the help of some colleagues who've contributed, it, 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 it's a good way marker for where we are with the whole now. Where we might be in 10 years time, I hope we'll be a lot further. Um, it's interesting coming to write a text like this on the back of writing the interpretive text for the representation, because that's all about these sort of short, clipped, rather bouncy statements in a way, and they're about trying to prompt little ideas or infer things or suggest things to people, and, and, and I'm comfortable with that. Writing an authoritative text, authoritative text, uh, we'll see. But it, you know, it, I'm, I'm intensely proud to have been given the opportunity to, to produce that and to, find, and to try and slot in these voices that I've talked about into, into that book. Um, and it remains, um, it remains the voices that I think I've sort of found in there that, that sort of drive me on with that building and what I want to continue the work with. Um, Edmund Dolber, in one newspaper article, he was interviewed, what's it like to live in the building uh, by yourself? Are there, are there any ghosts? He said, oh, I haven't seen any, I haven't heard any. That's it, full stop. <laughs> so he didn't think there were ghosts in there, but I like to think that I still sense him when I go into the panel room. And I like to think that I still sense this lot, uh, reprobates of things to be, in the writing of this, and I only hope that it kind of stands up to what they would have wanted. Thank you for your time and patience.
research that I'm going to show you. Now, the most important thing is, they're using it as a graphic.